Well, it sounds like we're, can you hear us okay? All right, we're on. I just want to, well, thank you, Andy, for that introduction to, for all of us. And it's just a great privilege and an honor for us to sponsor this uh, celebration of the 40th anniversary of the Truman Scholars Program. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Andy Rich and also, of course, Secretary Albright uh, for really the outstanding job that they have done in pulling together this program. In uh, about a year in, uh, that we've been talking about this, and I'm just delighted that we've reached this point today. Uh, I also wanted to again acknowledge, Andy made uh, uh, acknowledge this, but I want to repeat it that we've received uh, uh, really substantial funding for this program from the Audrey and Bernard Rappaport Foundation in Waco, Texas, and I just want to have a shout out to them as well before we get into the program. Uh, and I want to add that the decision for us to support uh, this conference was very easy to make, uh, primarily because the Truman Scholarships uh, over these past 40 years have uh, made such a significant contribution to uh, the public good with all of the gifted individuals, the students who um, the Truman Foundation's uh, support has made possible for them to go to school and to uh, enter public service. And so it was easy for us to sponsor something that was going to celebrate that. Uh, also, it gives us the opportunity, the Briscoe Center, the opportunity to bring attention to our own work, really, in furthering historical knowledge uh, through the research and the teaching that we support and that we facilitate. Uh, as well as the fact that, uh, Andy mentioned, we have as our divisions the Sam Rayburn Library in Bonham, Texas, and the John Nance Garner Museum uh, in Uvalde, Texas. And we also have a very, very close working relationship with the LBJ Library, our next door neighbor uh, at the University of Texas at Austin. Now we have three experts, as uh, Andy mentioned uh, today, to, who will join me in uh, discussing the relationship that Harry Truman had uh, with three Texans who were among the most influential and well-known political figures of their day. Cactus Jack Garner was Speaker of the House of Representatives, and he was later Vice President for the, two term, the first two terms of Franklin Roosevelt's administration. His protege, Cactus uh, Jack's protege, Garner, Jack Garner, uh, was Sam Rayburn. Uh, who was the longest serving Speaker of the House in American history. And then Rayburn's protege, uh, Lyndon B. Johnson, was Senate Majority Leader, John F. Kennedy's Vice President, and of course, President of the United States himself. So, uh, let's begin the discussion today with, I'm gonna turn to Dr. Nancy Beck Young, uh, who will start the discussion off about uh, Jack Garner and Harry Truman's relationship. So Harry Truman and John Nance Garner were cut from the same cloth in many ways. They were born and raised in rural backgrounds. They did not have the formal education of, say, a John F. Kennedy. And they both appreciated the experiences of the common man and the common woman. And that is what drove them to public service, I believe. Don already mentioned that Garner was FDR's first vice president, and Truman, of course, was FDR's last vice president. They shared skepticism about that office that they both held, with Garner once observing, supposedly, that the vice presidency wasn't worth a cup of warm spit. That's the sanitized <laughs> version of the quote. There's a less sanitized version, and I'll let your imaginations uh, take you wherever they will. <laughs> Harry Truman, not to be outdone, made a similar uh, observation about the vice presidency that it was like the fifth tit on a cow. <laughs> <laughs> no way to really change that one around that I can get to. <laughs> but hopefully that will suggest to you the common bond of the two men. Garner, of course, was Truman's senior. And Garner was in the vice presidency when Truman came to the Senate. So Garner was the presiding officer in, in the chamber. Garner gave Truman the same advice that he gave all new members, and that was to be quiet and learn how things work for a while. 
Garner did serve as a mentor to Truman when he was uh, a young center, senator. And if you went to Truman's Washington, D.C. home, you would see on his small bookshelf just a few books. Plutarch's Lives, Marky James' two-volume bio two biography of Andrew Jackson, Freeman's four-volume biography of Robert E. Lee, the Bible, stories of great operas, Don Quixote, and a biography of John Nance Garner. <laughs> Very interesting combination of books there. Garner and Truman did not always think alike, and perhaps the most important moment where they disagreed was with FDR's plan in 1937 to expand the size of the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court had been deciding against key New Deal measures, and FDR didn't want that trend to continue with pending court cases, so he hoped that expanding the size of the court would solve that problem. Truman was happy to support the president in that regard, but Garner said, I shall oppose it with all the strength that remains to me, but I don't imagine for a minute that it will do any good. Why, if the president asked Congress to commit suicide, it would do it. <laughs> so a little bit of frustration there. Not that long after, in the 1940 presidential election, Garner made a brief challenge to FDR. That didn't work out quite so well for him. And so he left Washington, D.C., crossing the Potomac for his native and beloved Texas, saying he would never go back again and he never went back again. Some had mistaken that statement as a resignation from politics uh, overall, and that would not be true, because Garner remained very involved in politics until he drew his last breath. When Truman became president, he said of Garner, well, when Garner, well, when Garner was vice president, there was hardly, uh, hardly a day when at least half the members of the Senate did not see him in his office or talk to him somewhere in the Capitol. In the past four years, when Henry Wallace was vice president, I doubt if there are a half dozen senators all told who have been in the vice president's office. You can draw your own conclusions. So Garner very much had provided a model for Truman and how he wanted to approach his increasingly important roles in public life. Fast forwarding to 1948, when Truman sought re-election or election to the presidency in his own right, he made the series of whistle-stop tours throughout the country. One region that he did not visit was the South, giving up on any hope of carrying Southern states with Strom Thurmond having split off into the Dixiecrat Party. But Truman did go to Texas, and he made a special point of going to Uvalde, Texas, on this whistle stop where he could meet with his old friend, Cactus Jack Garner. Truman needed Texas to win the White House, and he campaigned very well in Texas and throughout the country. Sam Rayburn said he is one of the folks and very good from the back platform. A crowd of 10,000 people showed up to greet Truman at the train station at 6.50 in the morning. And the high point of the Texas trip was a breakfast that Garner had for Truman. It was served on the back porch of Garner's home, and the crowd cheered. They couldn't care so much about Truman's civil rights agenda. Truman was a friend of John Nance Garner, and that was all that mattered to them. And Truman did indeed carry Texas. Garner came, or Garner, Truman came back to Texas to visit Garner one more time in 1958 for a celebration of Garner's 90th birthday party. Truman's airplane was delayed with mechanical troubles in Dallas, and so he did not get to Uvalde until late in the evening, past Garner's bedtime of 8 o'clock, so they agreed to talk the next morning after saying that each other was a sight for sore eyes. And I think that sums up nicely the Garner-Truman relationship. And I'll turn it over to my wiser and more learned colleagues. You want to talk about Ray? Sure. Yeah. I would add that 8 o'clock was pretty much Truman's bedtime. Yes. <laughs> they, they didn't miss out much. Harry Truman and Sam Rayburn had a lot in common, as Truman did with John S. Garner. They were both small town Southerners. 
They both prided themselves on their plain speaking, straight shooting care. They would tell things the way it was, the way they saw it. They didn't feel inclined to mince words for political benefit. And perhaps most important, at least for the relationship between the two, they were loyal Democrats. And they would stand by the Democratic Party. So there was a lot in the background of the two that might have made them friends. But the fact that they became important political partners was less foreordained. And in fact, it was largely a matter of accident. The accident was the death of Franklin Roosevelt. Sam Rayburn came to real political power before Harry Truman. He was Speaker of the House starting in 1940. Truman was a member of the Senate. And he developed a certain reputation during World War II in terms of keeping an eye on government spending on the war. And that brought him to national attention, or at least the attention of Franklin Roosevelt. And when there was a revolt in the Democratic Party in 1944 against Henry Wallace, Roosevelt was looking for someone that he could talk into the vice presidency and who wouldn't create another revolt in the party. And Harry Truman was sufficiently regular that the party accepted Harry Truman. And Truman's appreciation of the vice presidency declined from the moment he was actually elected vice president. And he shared John S. Garner's low opinion of it. And while he was trying to figure out what to do with himself, he used to hang out with Sam Rayburn. And Rayburn had this hideaway deep in the bowels of the Capitol, where what he called the Board of Education used to meet late in the afternoon. And they would share whiskey or their favorite dream. And they would ruminate on politics in Washington, the fate of the Democratic Party. And Harry Truman was in Sam Rayburn's office on a momentous day in April 1945, when he got word that a call had come from the White House. And it was important that he call the White House. So he did. He called the White House. And the first thing he said, according to somebody who was there, he's put down the phone and he said, I have to quote here, Jesus Christ and General Jackson. <laughs> this is what Harry Truman said. He knew that something was up. He went to the White House and he discovered that Franklin Roosevelt had died. And he was now President of the United States. And he would realize that his relationship with Sam Rayburn all of a sudden had become very much more important. To the surprise, actually, of both of them. When Harry Truman became President, he had no idea that he was about to launch two revolutions in American affairs. A revolution in domestic affairs that didn't go as far as he wanted. It would take another 15 or 20 years. But Harry Truman was the first president since Reconstruction to believe that the president needed to take a positive role in improving race relations. And so Harry Truman, for example, was the one who issued the executive order to desegregate the military. That's one that, that hung fire while Truman was still president. But it was essential to the relationship between Truman and Rayburn. The other, perhaps more far-reaching revolution was that that Harry Truman launched in American foreign affairs. And in both of those areas, Truman made Rayburn uncomfortable. Rayburn, like very many other people in the United States, especially those not from one of the coasts, had an idea that after World War II, the United States might gradually recede from responsibility for world affairs that it had taken after Pearl Harbor and would somehow approximate the previous attitude of the country toward the rest of the world. Truman realized that this simply wasn't going to work. The world would not remain peaceful. The world would not remain well-ordered unless the United States continued to play a large role. And one of the moments at which Harry Truman had to call on Sam Rayburn was when Truman was presenting Congress with what became the Marshall Plan. And I will let Truman tell the story. He invites Sam Rayburn into his office. I called in Sam Rayburn, says Truman, and when I told him what we had in mind, he just wouldn't believe it. 
His first reaction was just like everybody else's. He said we couldn't afford it. He said, Mr. President, it will bust the country. And I said to him, Mrs. Truman, Sam, if we don't do it, Europe will have the worst depression in its history. And I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of people will starve to death. And we don't want to have a thing like that on our consciences. Not if it's something we can prevent. No, we don't. If we let Europe go down the drain, then we're going to have a bad depression in this country. And you and I have both lived through one depression. And we don't want to have to live through another. Do we, Sam? Rayburn says, no, we don't. He swallowed hard and he said, Harry, how much do you figure this thing is going to cost? <laughs> and Truman says, and I looked him right in the eye. I never told Sam anything less than the whole truth at all times. That's the kind of relationship we had. I looked him right in the eye and I said, it's going to cost about 15, 16 billion dollars, Sam. But then Truman went on to say that now, he had worked on behalf of saving the government money during the war. Now, Sam, he said, I figure I saved the people of the United States about 15, 16 billion dollars with that committee of mine. <laughs> and you know that better than anyone else. And we're going to need that money, and we can save the world with it. So Reagan says, Harry, I'll do my damnedest. It won't be easy, but you can count on me to help all I can. And Truman remembered, and he did, too. There was another moment when Sam Rayburn essentially came to the rescue of Harry Truman. Nancy has described this a little bit from the perspective of John Nance Garner, when Truman is running for election in his own right in 1948. And his stance on civil rights has prompted a revolt within the Democratic Party. And Strom Thurmond has led is about to lead half the South out of the Democratic Party into the, the state's rights, Democratic Party as they call it. And so Truman is trying to shore up support in the South wherever he can. So he goes to Texas and Jack Garner holds a breakfast for him at Uvalde. And Sam Rayburn rode on the train with him. Mm -hmm. And Sam Rayburn invited him to Bonham, Texas, where he's he holds a reception, and he says that you know, everybody in East Texas is going to come, and so we're going to make sure that Texas turns out for our Democratic president. Now, Rayburn himself had some questions about, at the very least, whether the timing was right for the civil rights reform that Truman proposed. But Rayburn was a good enough Democrat to say, this is our president, we're going to stick with him. So he invited all of his friends, and they all show up. And he gives a speech on his behalf. He emphasizes not civil rights, because he knows that's going to be divisive within Texas. He emphasizes instead foreign policy. And speaking of Truman's foreign policy, and speaking of Truman as a candidate, he says, this is Rayburn, his shoulders are broad enough, his heart is big enough, and his mind is keen enough. Well, I don't know if all the Texans who came to the reception were listening to this. But this was Sam Rayburn, and so they were going to come. Margaret Truman was along on the journey, and she recalled to the guests that were coming to Rayburn's house, just on Highway 56, just west of Bonham. She says, they came in droves, and they kept coming. They kept coming in such numbers that they alarmed the Secret Service. Because the Secret Service, actually, I should point out, that Harry Truman would be the object of an assassination attempt. But the Secret Service was worried about this, and they wanted to basically vet everybody who came to the reception. And Sam Rayburn stood up and said, I know every man, woman, and child here. I'll vouch for you. <laughs> so they all came, the Secret Service kind of grinding his teeth. And Rayburn was willing that everybody should come and pay Truman. But he didn't want to give more of a party than necessary. And when he realized that some of the guests were coming through the reception and the eating line twice, he turned to Beauregard Jester, who was a, the Texas governor, 
And he said, shut the door, Beaufort. They're coming through twice. <laughs> anyway, Raymond's support for Truman was absolutely critical in holding half the South for Truman. And that's what gave Truman the victory in 1948 and made possible the completion of Truman's revolution in foreign policy, including the North Atlantic Alliance, American support for South Korea, and the Korean War, and so on. And it was, it was this sort of partnership that made Truman the president that he was. Um, again, Rayburn didn't agree with everything that Truman did or said, but he believed that Truman was somebody that he could really see eye to eye with. And I'm going to leave Rayburn the last line in here. And this is something that Truman would have certainly endorsed, especially when Truman became the object of criticism for all sorts of people. Rayburn used to like to say, any jackass can kick a barn down, but it takes a carpenter to build one. Well, Bill, thank you. Let's, uh, let's hear from Mark about what uh, his relationship with Lyndon Johnson, Mark. Let me start by adding LBJ's contribution to uh, disparaging the vice presidency. He said, since Nancy Beck Young set the precedent here with very earthy language from uh, Cactus Jack Gardner, uh, Johnson said that being vice president was like being a stuck pig in a screwing match. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, and, and like these the gentlemen that uh, Nancy and Bill have spoken about, uh, Lyndon Johnson and Harry Truman were very much cut from the same cloth. Both were born of modest means in, in small town America, what we might call flyover country today. Uh, and they never forgot where they came from. Truman never went to college, though he read every book in the Independence Missouri Public Library. Lyndon Johnson went to college at Southwest Texas State Teachers College. Both men, of course, were accidental presidents, stepping into the outsized shoes of their eloquent, Brahmin-born, Harvard-educated uh, predecessors. Truman assumed the presidency upon the death of the titanic Franklin Roosevelt and LBJ after the assassination of the eloquent and graceful John F. Kennedy. When Truman took office, the Washington Post didn't have a particularly high opinion of him, writing, we would be less than candid at this grave moment if we did not recognize the great disparity between Mr. Truman's experience and the great responsibility that has been thrust upon him. And LBJ said of Kennedy, he was a great public hero, and anything that I did somehow, uh, if it wasn't approved of, they would always say that President Kennedy would have done it better, that he wouldn't have made the mistakes that I made. And yet, both Truman and Johnson became near great presidents. They shared an acute sense of social justice. While Truman and Johnson never forgot where they came from, they advanced the cause of civil rights despite growing up in places where racism was virulent and where their civil rights policies were immensely unpopular. Truman desegregated, as Bill mentioned, the military and pushed in vain for civil rights laws. Johnson passed a, a trilogy of transformational civil rights legislation, passing the Civil Rights Act of 1964 to break the back of Jim Crow in the South, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, and the Fair Housing Act of 1968. And they both shared a great personal bond. LBJ rose from the House to the Senate during Truman's tenure in office, eventually becoming the uh, Senate minority whip during Truman's last years as president. Johnson admired Truman and considered him a mentor. Truman had many daddies, as he would call them, including uh, Sam Rayburn. And he also considered Truman, in some ways, a daddy. When LBJ became president, he often paid tribute to Harry Truman, perhaps anticipating his own post-presidency and hoping that what goes around comes around. He lavished him with praise and attention, showing Truman that while he was gone back to his 
modest life in Independence, Missouri, after leaving the splendor of the presidency, that he certainly wasn't forgotten. This is a, a taped telephone conversation of LBJ calling Truman after Truman had called him in vain to express his congratulations after Johnson won, won a, a landslide victory to earn the presidency in 1964. You'll hear uh, Truman and LBJ very clearly, and then Truman brings on his wife, Bess, to talk to the president as well. Mr. President, I love you as everybody in America does, and I'm just so honored that you would take the time to call me. Well, I know it's because I think you better record than never been equal than never will be. No, anybody, anybody got your record never equal it. When you go to looking at the Truman Doctrine and NATO and Marshall Plan and everything else, it makes all those look like pygmies, and I know it, and then I got one, that's one good thing about me. I've got sense enough to know it, but I... You're all right in my book, and I just want to congratulate you. I feel just as happy about you. I know you you feel happier because you always been you always been more for your party and the other folks than you have been to yourself. And uh, I just want you to know, as long as I'm in that office, you ain't it, and it's not a privilege of it, or a power of it, or a purpose of it that you can share and. Uh, uh, your bedroom's up there waiting for you, and your plane standing by your side, and uh, your doctors, and anything else you want or need. Why, and I got Uncle Sam. Well, the first time I'm able to have a uh, get around, I'd like to come see you and just talk over old time. Tell Miss Truman that we love her, but anything that you want or need, you tell her. All right, you just let me tell her. Miss Truman, I was just. Oh, I know you are, and uh, uh, y'all are, are the responsible part of any two in the nation. Uh, the, the wonderful work that you've done and the great uh, help he's been to me. And, uh, well, no, that's my wonderful you say that. No, but that's true. He never he's always had time for me. He's always... Yeah, he's of course, he has. He, he's uh, always thought more of uh, his party and his friends than he has for himself, and you make him watch himself now because well, he's no spring chicken. <laughs> While that was very magnanimous on LBJ's part, my suspicion it was, is that it was just a tad self-serving, <laughs> and that LBJ hoped desperately that his successor would take care of him in the same way that he was taking care of his predecessor. When LBJ signed Medicare into law in 1965, he insisted on doing so at the Truman Library, since Truman had tried and failed to pass similar legislation when he was president. At the signing, LBJ paid tribute to Truman for planting the seeds of compassion and duty, which have today flowered into care for the sick and serenity for the fearful. He then presented the first two Medicare cards, numbered one and two, to Harry and Bess Truman, respectively. In so doing, he called him, Truman, the real daddy of Medicare, and was in all likelihood uh, paying tribute to one of his own daddies at the same time. But LBJ also took great comfort in being around Truman, another who had shouldered the burden of the presidency during a turbulent and ultimately very consequential time. In May of 1968, during a trip to the West Coast, uh, from the West Coast back to Washington, LBJ insisted on visiting Truman in Independence along the way. When LBJ aide Larry Temple called the Truman house, house rather, to propose the visit, Bess Truman declined, saying that uh, Harry was, had company recently and he, he was a tad bit worn out. LBJ was uh, not one to take no for an answer, and he was sure that Bess Truman didn't understand that he was coming to Independence and wanted to call on them, so he insisted that Larry Temple ask again, which Larry Temple dutifully did. He called Mrs. Truman back, and she re reluctantly consented, but she had conditions. She ordered that there be no more than 10 people in the presidential entourage 
tramping across her lawn and on her living room rug. <laughs> the president uh, was supposed to show up at Truman's house at 2 o'clock, and a little after 3 o'clock, finally, the presidential entourage arrived. Uh, and Johnson bounded up the steps to the porch of the Truman home, thrust his hand out to the 33rd president and said, hi, Mr. President, sorry we're late. Without missing a beat, Truman replied, you ought to be. It's your own damn fault. If you left on time, you'd have gotten here on time. <laughs> <laughs> there was also the matter of the size of the presidential entourage. <clears throat> Larry Temple began counting those in LBJ's party, all standing on Mrs. Truman's rug. He stopped counting when he got to 20. Wisely, he declined to introduce himself to Mrs. Truman. But as LBJ said after his visit with the 33rd president, I feel stronger when I leave him. My guess is that Harry Truman felt a little stronger too. Thank you. Thank you. You know, we've been talking, and I, I particularly was talking, to, uh, referring to Cactus Jack. You know, Nancy, you want to explain where that comes from, Cactus Jack? Sure, sure. So before John Nance Garner went to the U.S. House of Representatives, he served first as a judge and then in the Texas State Legislature, which, by the way, he used his uh, seat in the Texas, uh, Texas State Legislature to draw his own congressional district one that he would be sure to win, and win he did multiple times over. But while he was in the Texas State Legislature, the lawmakers were debating what the state flower of Texas should be. And most people know that it's the blue bonnet. The blue bonnet won out here. But John Nance Garner was a proponent of the prickly pear cactus being the state flower of Texas. And he lost that battle, but gained the nickname Cactus Jack as a result. And I can only imagine what parents in Texas would think if they had to go plop their young children down in a field of prickly pear, prickly pear cactus for the photo op that happens instead in the field of blue bonnets. So maybe it was a good thing that Garner lost on that one. We, uh, and I'll put in a little advertisement here, we produced a documentary on the life of John Nance Garner, and Truman figures prominently in it, and PBS has broadcast it uh, the last couple of months. I think it's covered about 80% of the PBS market of this called Cactus Jack uh, Garner Lone Star on Capitol Hill, so I want to recommend it to you for viewing. Uh, let me also mention that uh, because the uh, Sam Rayburn Library is a division of the uh, Center for uh, the Briscoe Center for American History. I'm, I'm interested in Truman's relationship with the Sam Rayburn uh, Library Museum because I think it, it sort of uh, uh, provides a little bit of an insight into what probably most of us already know about Truman's love of books and and reading. Uh, when Sam Rayburn was uh, he, Sam Rayburn won a, a Civic uh, uh, Achievement Award. I think it was Reader's Digest, uh, but at any rate, he received this cash award, and Rayburn, who died almost, uh, he had very little money uh, when he died, he was kind of like Truman, in that he never accumulated any personal wealth, wealth at all. I didn't know really what to do with this money, because he was very, it just was against, uh, you know, uh, he didn't like to take money from lobbyists or anyone else. So at any rate, Truman suggested to him that uh, it'd be a great idea to have a, uh, have a library. Uh, and he, su he suggested to, uh, uh, to Truman, um, excuse me, Truman suggested to Rayburn uh, that, uh, you know, we don't have enough libraries. Why don't you take that money and set up uh, your own library someplace? And uh, it really was the seed, the kernel uh, that uh, made uh, Truman, um, excuse me, uh, made Rayburn go on and create the Sam Rayburn Library. And in doing so, one of the things that uh, uh, also came into play is that uh, uh, Truman uh, saw to it that uh, when Rayburn provided absolutely critical uh, support in the Congress and led the House, um, as you were pointing out about the, the Marshall Plan, uh, <coughs> the Greek government 
uh, presented uh, Sam Rayburn with, a, with a, a vase that was more than 2,000 years old. Uh, and it's incredibly valuable. I'm, uh, it's an amazing piece of, of art, ancient art. But at any rate, they presented it to him. And uh, Truman uh, suggested to uh, Rayburn, if you get that library built, that would be a great place to put that vase because Rayburn wasn't really sure where a 2,000 year old or 3,000 year old Greek vase would set in his office. And so that all came together and provided some impetus into creating this, this really wonderful community and state resource that we have, the Sam Rayburn Library. And so, uh, Truman also played a role in connecting the National Archives with uh, Rayburn to uh, plan the library and set it up and, and so forth. And then he told Rayburn that he would come and dedicate the, uh, uh, the, the library museum when it was ready to open. And so in uh, 1957, Truman, of course, who is now a former president, makes a trek to Little Bonham, Texas, which uh, for those of you who may not geography of Texas may not be that uh, good, is uh, between Dallas-Fort Worth, it's just to the northeast of Dallas-Fort Worth near the Oklahoma border near Red, the Red River. And uh, Truman went down and uh, gave the uh, dedication speech to, for the Sam Rayburn Library. We have film of that and it's, it's a great moment. The other thing I want to mention is Doc Briscoe and Tr Truman. Uh, We've already talked about uh, how important it was that, uh, that, that John Nance Garner was to Truman's campaign in 1948 in Texas. As, we, as you may recall, uh, the odds were strongly against Harry Truman being elected president in 1948 to his own term. Uh, everyone expected Thomas Dewey to win that, to win that election, including Thomas Dewey. Uh, and uh, as the Democrats were split, the Dixiecrats, you mentioned that with uh, Strom Thurmond and, uh, and everything. And uh, so it was very critical that, uh, that Truman could carry Texas, but no one really gave him a chance. And that's when uh, this visit with Garner, as you've already mentioned, was so important. But uh, when he came to Uvalde, uh, Garner, there was some question, because Garner was not, Garner actually left the New Deal uh, and he split with Roosevelt when he left Washington. Uh, he was against Social Security. Uh, he was against labor unions. Uh, he was very uh, unhappy with the Second New Deal, which was the so-called li more liberal New Deal. Um, he was a prairie populist, Garner was, and he was very supportive of the reforms of Wall Street uh, and the banking uh, industry in this country. He was a small town banker himself. Uh, but, so there was some question about whether uh, Garner would be that active and uh, supportive of Truman but because of uh, the Democrats coming back to the White House. Uh, wouldn't, it was never a question. It was never a problem. Garner absolutely was a huge fan of Truman. So he welcomed him to Uvalde. Governor Briscoe was the host uh, uh, for this. He was not governor at this time. He was the state legislator. This is 1948. But they concocted this harebrained scheme with Garner where uh, this was, Uvalde is sheep and goat country in Texas. It's in southwest Texas. Uh, it's to the west of San Antonio. And <clears throat> they were all sheep and goat raisers out there. But they didn't raise cattle. And they decided to get a goat and put uh, clothing on the goat that said, that read, Dewey's goat. And they decided that when <coughs> Vice President, when Garner and Truman came in the convertible uh, into town after Truman's train arrived, and they were going to have this breakfast that we were talking about, uh, that uh, they would take the goat, they would have the press there from San Antonio, and then the normal press, of course, that accompanied the president when he was on okay, tape, and they would, they would uh, have the president of the sheep and goats uh, raisers uh, come and take the goat. And this is a different world that we live in, that we live in today, okay? And they would walk up to the president who's sitting in the back of the convertible with John, with uh, John Nance Garner and present Dewey's goat, a big letters Dewey's goat, uh, to President Truman. And there was some question about whether this was in good taste or what, you know, whatever. And uh, so <coughs> they, they did do it though. Uh, they brought the goat out, and Truman is sitting there, and there's a film of this. 
and he's, you can just see the shock, the shock on his face when they pick this goat up and dump it in his lap. It says, it says do this goat. And then Governor Briscoe makes this little speech and this, this other book about, well, we're going to get Dewey's goat. And, and Truman's going to get Dewey's goat, and here it is, like that. And uh, uh, John Nance Garner uh, starts laughing, and he said, well, Dewey's goat probably is going to have a call from nature any minute. <laughs> so maybe Dewey's goat ought to leave. <laughs> so they picked him up and go on. The other really quick story is that when uh, Truman told Garner that he would be back for his 90th birthday, um, uh, the, uh, he was there, and uh, as, as everyone in Texas knew, John Nance Garner liked his bourbon. And it was kind of a test. You needed to have a couple of glasses of bourbon with, uh, with Cactus Jack when you visited him. And uh, of course, Truman liked his bourbon also. So they drank some bourbon. Uh, together uh, the night that, uh, that Truman spent uh, there in Uvalde. And President Truman's actually slept in the Briscoe home that night, Governor Briscoe's home. So President Truman had a couple of glasses of stiff bourbon, and it was time for them both to go to bed. As you mentioned, they both mm -hmm. went to bed at 8 o'clock. And uh, Truman got up and he turned to Governor Briscoe and said, Dolph, uh, now listen, I, I need for you to call Bess. Uh, and tell her that I'm fine, but I've gone on to bed. Uh, and then left, went to the bedroom, laid down. Anyway, a little later on, uh, come to find out, the reason he did is because Bess absolutely forbade him to drink. <laughs> and, and he knew that when he got on the phone, she would be able to pick up <laughs> that he'd been drinking, and he didn't want to handle it. He didn't want to deal with it. So, um, any, any, uh, I think we've got about three minutes here. Anybody want to add? Uh, so, you know, one of the things I, I should have mentioned is you talked about the modest uh, means that uh, uh, Truman had upon a leaving office. And indeed, he was, uh, went back to the same home that he and Bess had lived in uh, before he went to Washington in 1934, which had been owned by his in-laws and uh, didn't have a lot of money. In fact, if not for the sale of family farmland, uh, he would have been broke. And Lyndon Johnson and uh, some of his colleagues in the Senate knew that. And they ended up, uh, because in those days there was no presidential pension, there were no emoluments for uh, former presidents of any kind. Truman had sold a book to make a little bit of money, but given the draconian tax code at the time, lost much of that in taxes. And then um, People would send him the book to sign and would not give a return envelope. So he f spent about $35,000 by his own estimation in postage alone. So this uh, package for former presidents that was approved by Lyndon Johnson and some of his colleagues allowed for a modest presidential pension around the same amount of money that a CEO at the time would get, franking privileges so that he could send things out in the mail and some other emoluments, including office space. So it further saved Harry Truman from financial embarrassment. And again, benefited Lyndon Johnson, too. Funny thing. <laughs> well, uh, join me in thanking my colleagues here. And I, I, uh, and I again want to say what a privilege it is for us to sponsor this conference and how much we appreciate your being here. And you have enough, we have some more wonderful things that are going to be happening this afternoon as well. So thank you again. Appreciate it.